And so I outbid everybody else based on data, not on ego. Yeah. Yeah. But it's like I just had a tool set that they didn't have. And I was able to crunch the numbers, talk to my investors, and basically figure out how much more we could pay to still get the kind of return we wanted. That was a, yeah, secret weapon. It's kind of like a secret weapon. Superpowers. I did, well, ask your question. I didn't have one. No, I'm, I didn't you, have one. You have a question that you ask me at the beginning of every episode. It's mm. like part of the gig. Oh, yeah. What is this? What podcast is this again? <laughs> what do you teach me today, Bo? There we go. Okay, thank you. Now I can start. You had this idea. You're like, I wonder if we could test how much I've learned over, you know, 30 some odd episodes because, mm -hmm. you know, the shtick when we started was I'm the expert and you're the idiot. And yeah. You're certainly not an idiot anymore when it comes to commercial real estate. And there's uh -huh. so much that you've learned. You've had some really high caliber guests on the show teaching us stuff and and um so i thought we might have it and well this is your idea like let's let's throw some things at you and just see what you've picked up yeah right? and yeah. we'll compare this to what somebody who's testing for the ccim designation would have to know are you smarter than a designee you're not yeah no but, but am you, i <laughs> <laughs> the answer's no on my designee friends. He's not there yet. No, we'll see. Um, we'll see. So I'm just going to ask you some broad questions, okay. and we'll see where you are. Some of the stuff we haven't talked about, some of the stuff we have. Right? Okay. I'm not just going to ask you the stuff that we've covered. All right. Oh, I'm going to okay. ask you a few things that we haven't covered. Let's see uh, where I'm at with that. I don't want you to get a big head. Okay, All right, so cool. What's in OI? That's the net operating income. That's very true. Now, what actually is it, though? The amount of money that you're getting from the, the net operating income. It's how much money that 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 it's it's making. The 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 thing is making. Yeah. So that so that is not incorrect, mm -hmm. but that's a very very simplified answer. So let me just frame yeah. it up a hair. Okay. Net operating income, you take the operating income mm -hmm. of the property and you subtract out the operating expenses, expenses. Right. and you end up with the NOI. Okay. The mm -hmm. reason you call them operating expenses is because some expenses aren't tied to the building. Yeah. You can have capital expenses that are not ongoing, regular expenses of operating property. You might have to place a, replace the roof. Well, that's not an ongoing repetitive expense like property taxes or lawn care right. or whatever. So capital expenses, uh, you don't factor in to net operating income, nor do you factor in the debt. So yeah, right. interest payments, that's tied to the owner, right? right. not the property, right? Uh, the actual expense. Mm -hmm. So yeah, good. Net Remember. operating income, that's pretty good. Yeah. All right. Uh, have we ever talked about gross rent multipliers? Oh, GRMs? Yeah, GRMs. <laughs> uh, gross rent multiplier. No, but I could. So this is a very, very simple. Well, yeah. no, but I can. Do you want to ask? Yeah. Uh, like, what's the question? What is it? Oh. <laughs> gross rent multiplier. Mm -hmm. um, it's those things that raise the rents. It's what you can pretty much predict whether rents, you can hike them up or not. It's, you know, it's, yeah, it's. Um, nope. You're multiplying. Not that one either. Yeah. Mm -mm. You're multiplying the rents. And you don't like it. It's gross. All right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is kind of a gross metric in my opinion, because I think it oversimplifies things. The way you would do it is you take the value of the property divided by the rents. And it gives you a multiple. I've never worked with anybody that uses GRM. To me, it's just so simplified. It's just revenue. You're not dealing with expenses. Um, but it's a way to test a deal. Gotcha. And if the value is, and the rents are here, and the, the GRM's like 40, some huge multiple, 
you're like, that's just right off the bat, that's way out of whack. So yeah. it's a very high level, quick, easy to calculate data point right. when you're considering a deal. Yeah, gotcha. Okay. And to know how to evaluate it, you have to know what normal is. And man, I don't know anybody around here that, I, I don't even. I mean, what is normal changes all the time? I don't know. Especially I, in this climate. Yeah, but I don't even know what they are. Like I never think about GRM. Mm. So my guess is some places in the country, GRM is probably something that's just people talk about it. They use it a little bit and it might be a first test back of the napkin kind of, is this worth even looking into or not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've considered doing an episode on this one, but okay. we haven't yet. Okay. Net present value, NPV. You've mentioned it, the net present value. Okay. You just want to. Yeah. It's, Give it a stab. I, what is the value of it as it is right now? No, that's actually more like intrinsic value. Yeah, intrinsic. Well, yeah. let's just talk through the, the cycle of owning a piece of property. Okay. Say you go buy an apartment complex. Mm -hmm. Okay. You put money into the deal. Okay. And then as you own it, you're getting cash flow out of the deal. Mm -hmm. You know, they pay rent monthly and ideally you're making more than what it costs you to operate it. Sure. And you still have enough to pay your debt service if you borrowed and you've got some left over. And so you're making a return on the money that you've put in. The net operating you, income, yeah. It, well, it's, income minus expenses. Well, after net operating income, then you pay your debt service. And ah, so gotcha. then the money left over, that's what you can start to- Just a little clarity you know. for all you. So, so you're getting all the a monthly or quarterly return on the money, on your investment that you put in the deal. And at the end, you get, you know, you sell the property and get a big check, hopefully, at yeah. the end, because it's worth more than what you bought it for or whatever. All of those cash flows happen in the future. And there's a time element to money, the time value of money, which says a dollar today is worth more than a dollar five years from now. Because of inflation, that dollar in the future isn't worth as much as it is now. Or if you want to put it another way, your purchasing power for the same amount of money, what you can buy with it decreases over mm -hmm. time as inflation. Yeah. So dollars today are worth more than dollars in the future. Mm -hmm. So if you can predict what all your future cash flows are going to be on a piece of property, you can discount them all back to today mm. and figure out what the net present value is of that property. Yeah, so you're essentially figuring out the value of the dollar today taking future cash flows you mm -hmm. discount them back and that discount rate is investor specific yeah when i do npv calculations when i'm looking at a deal mm -hmm. i just always use 10 percent. yeah okay is like, that common across the board no it's very investor specific yeah and that allows me to compare it to other deals ah. which might that one might be a three-year hold this one might be a five-year hold this one you know, different types of properties where they don't, they're kind of apples and oranges. Yeah. You can just take a look at the, the cash flow projections, discount them back and figure out what the NPV is. Yeah. And you can start to compare investments. Yeah, gotcha. And there's one other thing really cool that you can do with NPV. If you run an NPV calculation on future cash flows and say your internal rate of return for those future cash flows is 15%. Okay. Mm -hmm. And let's say that the person you're working with, the investor, or you, the investor, let's say your requirement, 16.5% mm -hmm. internal rate of return. The NPV calculation will tell you if you pay this much less, that 15% will turn into a 16.5. Oh. So it's a way, and I've absolutely used this. Matter of fact, I'll tell you how I've used this. The deal I pitched you, when I was going about trying to buy that deal, there were two other parties trying to buy the deal. Mm -hmm. I was in a competitive bidding environment, which I don't like. Mm -hmm. And doesn't happen around here very often, all right? But in this case, I was. And so I ran, I did the underwriting for the deal, and it looked like we were going to be able to get a 16 or 17% of return. Or... I was going to be able to offer the investors in the deal 16, 17%. Well, that's pretty good. Like I can sell those deals all day long. I can, I can get people interested in 16, 17%. Mm -hmm. 
if everything else looks good. Like I feel good about that number. But I called some of the guys that I knew would be interested in this deal. And I basically said, look, 16, 17% is what it looks like. But we're in a bidding environment. Like, would you still be interested in the deal if it were 14? And I basically got some yeses. So I plugged 14% into that MPV calculation, mm -hmm. and it told me how much more I could pay. Oh. And so I outbid everybody else based on data, not on ego. Yeah. Yeah. And so I did. I paid a little. Just to, I, I ended up just having to pay a little bit more than I wanted to. But I knew the numbers supported it, and I was still going to be able to raise the money that we needed to do the deal right. and make it still work. But the guys I was bidding against, That's one of them had a residential realtor that was advising them. But it's like I just had a tool set that they didn't have, and I was able to crunch the numbers, talk to my investors, and basically figure out how much more we could pay to still get the kind of return we wanted. That was a yeah, secret weapon. It's kind of like a secret weapon. Superpower. So NPV, it's it's a real nice thing. Now, I just mentioned internal rate of return, IRR. But mm -hmm. that's another foundational metric in commercial real estate that most people misunderstand or don't even know exist. But we've talked about it a number of times. So why don't you explain to me? Yes. So the internal rate of return is the amount of money that you'll be making per year. No. Uh, off of the property that you've that you've got. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's been a while. It's been a while. Um, how far off am I? <laughs> uh, you're in the ballpark. Yeah, I think I'm. I'm talking about cash on cash. Really, uh, is what I'm thinking. You weren't specific enough to really differentiate, but let's put okay. it in these terms. Internal rate of return is you take a certain amount of dollars mm -hmm. and invest it into a property. Yeah. Okay. What IRR tells you is what kind of a return on average annually yes. will those dollars make over the course of the deal? And it includes the reversion or the money you make when you sell. Right. So you put $100,000 into a deal. It pays you back cash as you own it if it's a good deal. And then at the end, you sell it hopefully for more and you in, you factor in the time value of money and then you average out what's my average annual return. Right. Or how hard did my money work for me while it was in that deal? Yeah, gotcha. And in my opinion, it's the best me analysis metric for an investment real estate calculation. Like yeah, yeah. It's yeah, the yeah. one I look at. Because it factors in rent increases, future sales day, right. or future sales price, and all that stuff. It factors all that in, and it tells you, on average, annually, how hard did my money work for me? Right. And that's that's really what you want to know. Right. So and I, now with that refresher, I know, ca I don't know if cash on cash was the next thing you were going to ask about or talk about. but Well, just tell me anyway. Yeah, so internal rate of return, you know, factors that the average over after it's sold, this is how much you're making per year. Cash on cash is what you're making during the deal per year or per quarter. Or that's generally it a. It's per year? generally talked about in an annual right chunk. Yeah, right. So that's what you'll be making during the deal, not factoring in the sell or what the the internal rate of return. So much. It's just this is the amount of cash flow I can expect. Uh. At that, this time now. That year. Yeah, that year before the seller. So you figure it out by saying, okay, in 2024, this deal should pay me X amount of dollars. And then you divide that by how many dollars you put in the deal. And that'll give you the percentage of your cash on cash return that year. Yeah. Which might be 4%, might be 14%. But it is a data point in figuring out internal rate of return. Yeah. Cash on cash just looks generally at one year. Yeah. I've got this many dollars in it. It's your denominator and your numerator is how many dollars did it pay me back? Sure. That year. Yeah. 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 Okay. What is cost recovery? Does that ring a bell at all? Oh, cost recovery. If not, I'm going to ask you a different way. Okay. Ask me a different way. What's depreciation? Depreciation. Yes. That's uh, the value of the money goes down or the value of the 
property goes, the your money gets low, m less. No, in reality, your money gets more because of depreciation. What depreciation is is a phantom. Oh, yes, phantom expense. Yes. So when you do that cost segregation study, what well, you can depreciate forget faster. It. Yes, <laughs> yeah. that's true. Okay. So normal yeah. depreciation. Okay, normal. I know what it is. It's the in my building. There are things that are going to. Like the carpets. Stop right now, because okay. you're describing cost segregation. Oh, okay, okay. And you're overcomplicating. Like, here's depreciation. It's a phantom expense. The government allows you to depreciate your building, not your land, your building mm -hmm. over 39 years or 27 and a half years if it's residential. Mm -hmm. Can't do this with your house, by the way. Yeah. And so you take the value of your property, you divide it by 39, this is a little bit of an oversimplification, yep. okay? It's just a hair more technical with mid-month conversions and some things we're not gonna worry about right now. Awesome. <laughs> but you divide by 39, and then every year you depreciate the property by that amount. And so on paper, it wipes out some of your taxable income. Therefore, you pay taxes on less. Yeah. But no dollars left you. like. No actual animals were hurt in the making of this movie. Like yeah, no yeah. actual dollars left you. It's right. all an accounting thing. Right. And it reduces your taxable income. It shelters your income. Tax okay. shelter. So that's that's depreciation. Okay. It's all coming back to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now when I touch you. What is this? a cost segregation study? Cost segregation study is something you get an accountant or an engineer to come in, mm -hmm. take a look at all the individual aspects of your building. Okay. Once you have all those, you can group all that together to depreciate faster um, over time. What's the depreciation over time, right? Over the 39 years, the individual th things to add them up. And then you can depreciate all that from your taxable income. Kind of in one lump sum. Okay, stop. Because okay. now you're bleeding over into bonus depreciation. I don't want to. Oh, yeah, that. that's yeah, that's right. Bonus depreciation. The cost segregation study, as you suggested, is done by an engineer or an accountant. They come in, they basically break out all the components of your building, and they look at all those components and they say, well, this one's not a 39 year schedule like the building. The carpet should be on a five year schedule. And they, the landscaping should be on a 15-year schedule. The HVAC, gotcha. a 15-year schedule. They, I don't know if those are correct, by the way. Right, I think right. they might be. But they example. look at all the components, drapes, paint, you know, and they break it out. And they put them in these different buckets. Life now, cycles. Real property is considered that 39 or that 27 and a half if we're talking uh, residential. Mm -hmm. Personal property is the 15, 10, and the five-year buckets. Mm-hmm. And so if you take, you know, 30% of the building is no longer in that 39 year bucket, but now it's in the 15, 10 and five. Now you can depreciate the same amount. You just get to depreciate it earlier, yeah. faster. Therefore it shelters more income at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now the bonus depreciation component of this, which we talked about, mm -hmm. I think in one of our earlier episodes is that once you move some of the components from real property to personal property. So they go from 39 or 27 and a half to 15, 10 and five year buckets. Mm -hmm. You can bonus depreciate that amount all in one year. Right. Now that really moves the needle until 2023. 2023, you can bonus depreciate 80% of it. 2024, 60%. Right. Then 40%. So it's kind of sunsetting the bonus depreciation. Right. Uh, unless they recast it, unless they change the law and let you. Right. Which I hope they do. Well, we'll see what happens at the election. <laughs> yep. We will see. Okay. That's crazy, man. What is LTV? Um, loan to value. Yes. Yeah. And loan what's it value. mean? It's pretty much the amount that uh, the bank is going to allow you, what percentage the bank is going to allow you to borrow. Percentage of what? Uh, percentage of the value. Of the property. Of the property yep. value. Yep. Right? Yeah. And 
in the current market conditions, those LTVs are going down. Mm -hmm. So whereas a bank, you know, not too many years ago would on a multifamily deal would, would lend the buyer or the borrower 80% loan to value all day long. Mm -hmm. Now it might be 65%. Yeah. So it's a big, big difference. Big difference. Yeah. Okay. LTV is also those things you ride around on. ATV. 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 Automatic All to loan. Terrain. All terrain. Vehicle. vehicle. <laughs> yep. Okay. Great. Debt service coverage ratio. DSCR. Mm -hmm. So one of those financing, financial, uh, yeah, financing metrics. And I don't know that we've ever inherently... Debt Talked service. about it. Yeah, debt service coverage ratio. So you're going to take something and divide it by another to get this. That's true. So you're going to take your debt, how much you owe. Is that one of the variables? So, and you're just going to put that to the side. What do you think right debt now. service actually is? Would it have to do with the lender? Well, the let's person say. person who services your debt? Mm-mm. Your annual debt service is what you have to pay the bank because you have a mortgage. So it's your principal and interest payments oh, gotcha. for a year, your annual debt service. Okay. So your debt service coverage ratio would be your NOI divided by your- How much you owe? Annual debt service. Annual debt. So, oh, gotcha. NOI divided by the interest payments over that year? Yeah. What and what the bank will want to see is something like, 1.2, 1.3. I think 1.3 is kind of the number that that makes them start to feel a certain level of comfort. 1.5 means your NOI is 50% more than your debt service, mm -hmm. which which is a nice margin. Yeah. If your debt service coverage ratio is one. No good. That means 100% of your NOI goes to paying the debt. There's nothing left over. Right, yeah. You don't have much coverage. There's no cash flow yeah. for the owner. Right. There's no way to maintain the property. Or, right. You know, so. Gotcha. The bigger that number is, the the less of your NOI you're having to use to pay the debt. Sure. And the bank feels more comfortable with the deal. Yeah, yep. yeah, gotcha. Okay, what's the difference between equity versus debt financing equity versus debt financing so oh so with debt financing you're getting money that you have to pay back and in equity financing you're getting money what you're getting money in exchange for part of the company or a piece of the deal. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, that's not a bad explanation. Yeah. Right. Debt financing, you're borrowing money from someone or an institution and in return for that money interest. You're paying interest to them. Mm -hmm. And then towards the end of the term you're gonna give them that money back. Okay? Yes. Equity, you're selling a piece of the company. Yeah. To somebody who will actually have ownership in the deal. There's no ownership transfer with debt. Right. There is with equity. Right. All right. And so they're going to get a percentage of the profits, you know, the equ equity side of things. You're giving up ownership mm -hmm. for dollars, and then you're going to give them a percentage of the profits or the money that this deal makes. Right. Like Shark Tank. With debt. Yeah. With debt, man, doesn't matter if the business is crushing it and exploding or if it completely fails you owe yeah but you don't have to give up ownership mm -hmm. so that's yep okay yep. good nice explain to me two different types of leases and i'll give you a bonus point if you can if you can Name think a of third. a third cool how many different types of leases are there but Probably like six seven eight would are you looking for something more than a long-term lease yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not talking about term. Yeah. We're talking about like categories of leases. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you got a gross net lease Ooh. or gross gross lease? Yes. Yeah. Gross. Right. And what is it? You got a, uh, these are these are pretty gross because um, 
the owner of the building is responsible for most of the expenses. Okay, that's good. Okay. If not all the expenses. Yeah. Yep. And then you got a net lease. Okay. Or a net through lease. Well, that all, where those expenses pass through. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I knew through was in there somewhere. They pass through to the tenant. Yep. And then we have, uh, we got a gross, you got a net. Oftentimes those net are referred to as triple net. Triple net. But. Yeah. Yeah, you're going to have to. So there's modified gross, okay. which is just somewhere in between. Yeah, okay. You, you might hear a hybrid. You can also do percentage rent. Oh. Have we ever talked about percentage rent? No. I, should, I have not seen a lot of percentage rent leases, okay? But when, when they happen, they're generally with retailers. And it's some version of, all right, if you're my tenant mm-hmm. and I'm the landlord, and you come to me and say, look, uh, got a ton of potential here. We've got a killer business model, but I need to keep my expenses low at the beginning. I might agree to a, a lower base rent, but then I get a percentage of your sales ah, yeah, above a certain break point. Mm-hmm. And you, you can divine this a, a ton of different ways. Maybe it's not on sales, but it's on profits or, you know, whatever but percentage rent is when you do better i do better yeah because i get a percentage of of your success not ownership right but that's kind of a right. really I'm simplified right now. version of yeah percentage yeah, yeah. rent yep. got it kind of like royalties until yeah hey, yeah i've never thought of it that way but that yeah. way what is a termination clause in a lease it's the clause that says that if you do this we terminate the lease like if you do this, the contract is null. Mm, no, normally what it means is the tenant has the right under these circumstances to choose to terminate the lease. And it might not have anything to do with the behavior gotcha. of the landlord. Yeah, okay, gotcha. It, so, it could, I guess. Yeah. Any, anything you agree to in a lease becomes part of the lease, but uh, uh, yeah, gotcha. within the law, but... In this case, it might be, yes, we will uh, sign a 10-year lease, but we want to be a, the ability to terminate the lease after three years with a termination penalty fee that is 40% of the remaining rent in the primary term or something. Like, it defines, and a lot of times you don't have termination leases uh, yeah. or termination clause clauses. in the lease, yeah. yeah. But it's basically the ability to terminate a lease based on a certain circumstance that you agree yeah, to pre, with yep. the mm-hmm. landlord. Mm-hmm. Generally a fee involved. Oh, I listen to the Trepwire podcast every week. Yeah. And what they do is they give you a recap of the week. What did the macroeconomic forces do that week? Mm-hmm. And then they take it down and they start talking about specific deals that happened. And a lot of their reporting on specific deals lately have been – companies vacating their office space, especially in San Francisco. And it's just, uh. and some of these companies are paying like $58 million termination fees, like big, big dollars. They had hundreds of thousands of square foot of office space and they're paying over $50 million to not use it. Whoa. Like that's, that comes out of a termination clause. Right. Oh, wow. Pretty crazy. Tripwire. Do you remember... The um, strategic analysis model. Yes, I think so. Like, I think you remember that we did an episode on it, but do you remember the model itself? I think as soon as we start talking about it, I can finish. Okay. So this is a model that I use on a regular basis to make a go, no go decision. Do I want to do this deal or not? Yes. Do I want to help my client? Yeah. The four feasibility tests. Mm -hmm. What are they? Uh, Location. Okay, location and site is location one of them. Location and site. Uh, political. Political and legal. And legal. Is one. Um, I'm highly impressed right now. Keep going. The, the money. Does the money make sense, right? The so financial feasibility. Financial feasibility. And then. Can you give me a clue? It starts with market. Market. Com- compare. Comparing. Uh, market. You're looking at the rest of the, the thing. That you're comparing the. Maybe your competition. Market competition, the competitive. Uh, Market and competitive analysis. analysis. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Because yeah, look, no property exists in a vacuum. They live in the context of their markets. And you cannot ever properly analyze a property without properly analyzing the market that it lives in. Yeah. So this uh, strategic analysis model helps you do that. The financial analysis is taking a look at the property itself. Does the the deal on the property look good? And now let's look at political and legal. It answers the question, will they, will let, they let me? It. Will they let mm -hmm. me? Right? And then you got location and site. All right. How is my location? Are there issues with the site? If it's a ground up development, do I have the zoning that I need? Do I have the entitlements to all of all that stuff, location mm -hmm. and site? And then competitive and market analysis. If I was going to do a self storage development, I'd look around at the other self storage facilities. Like, is the market oversaturated? Do they already have enough? How are rents? How are occupancies? Like, I'm analyzing the market. So, if I create new supply in that market, I've got a clue of how I'm going to do based on what already exists. Yeah. And, and that's the strategic analysis model at a very Bo, high level. Bo breaks down all of these in greater detail in this episode. That one. Mm hmm. That was that was one of my favorite episodes that we've done. I just saw, I just so clearly saw the value. Oh, the strategic of, analysis model. Yeah, the mm -hmm. feasibi the feasibility tests. Yep. You know, it's yep, just, yep, yep. Just so, and you so clearly laid it out. Oh, so clearly. Yeah, and yeah. then walking through deals that didn't go and why they didn't go because of these. Yeah, and I think we've dodged some landmines. Mm -hmm. because we've said no to opportunities that otherwise, if you didn't run it through the model, it might have just looked really good on paper right. and, and you missed some things. So, yeah. All right, what about absorption? What is absorption? absorption? By the way, I, I, I got to tell you this. Yeah. I've taught CI 102, I think, 14 times now. Mm -hmm. And I've never had a class where every student got the absorption questions right on the on the exam even still no and it's the simplest thing yeah i i don't know that i'll ever teach a class where they'll all get the absorption questions right yeah it's, and is that so on you is, is that on you as the teacher or well, is that on so. the students you know? well it's on them too but it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because i'm going i should to, be able to explain it well enough so yeah i think and i think i might know why cuz it sounds so close to absorption, like absorb. That's what it is. Is absorption uh, doesn't start with an O? See, I have ADHD. <laughs> <laughs> One so, many spelling bees lately. Yeah, yeah, I have ADHD, so I can't read very good. <laughs> Wait, that's a different disability, dyslexia. <laughs> I don't think I have that. Could. To absorb is an A. Yeah. A, B. Yeah. Absorption. Absorption. Um, maybe if you start to explain it, I could finish okay. it. Well, I had a conversation Just with blanket. Dad and our sister Cody this morning, and we were talking about an industrial market in Evansville. Mm -hmm. And I was explaining to them that there's been 50,000 square feet of absorption in the industrial submarket that we were talking about over the last 12 months. And all that means is that there's 50,000 square feet that went from vacant to occupy. Oh, yes, yes. Yep. But the formula is end of year occupied minus beginning of year occupied. It does not factor in at all the total amount of space in a market. It only factors in occupied space. Yeah. So how much occupied space is there at the end of the year? Say 100,000. Mm -hmm. How much was occupied at the beginning of the year? 80,000. Huh. So there were 20,000 square feet of absorption in that year. Okay, here's where I'm sitting at. At the end of year 23, at the beginning of the year 24, we're in the same year. Yep. That's... So let me be a little bit more Pacific. <laughs> yeah, let's go a little bit more Pacific. <laughs> you Paint take the this picture in, for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's your best skit ever, and you have to link to it. Okay, yeah. It, you can look. You can find this skit written, okay, by, look, uh, yeah, written by Ryan Staples. So look, great. when we point and send you to other episodes and stuff, you know, we're trying to link things together and make it easy, easy for you to, to get more information if you want. And increase our views and stuff all that's great 
but click on this one because that's a funny three minute sketch. Yeah, it's one. I think it's like one. one Maybe minute. it's two. But I mean, yeah. laugh out loud. That's my all time favorite. It's so that, it's that really good. Done. Yeah, Sterile. it's really good. Ryan Staples. That's from the mind of Ryan Staples. Yeah, really good. Yeah. All right. You want to talk a little EBA? Oh, I'd love to. So what does EBA stand for? Economic Based Analysis. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's this goes good. back to the very first. First episode we yeah. talked about this. Yeah, We've yeah. talked about it since, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Economic Based Analysis, uh, what is it? Uh, this is where you take a look. That it has to do with jobs, right? Mm-hmm. Always. Yeah. So you can take you could take a look at the jobs that are coming into a market and you can figure out what those jobs are are whether basic or non-basic all right what's the difference can't just throw terms like that around. sure that, no you can't a basic job would be like what i do it doesn't basic sounds like basic like basic bitch right mm-hmm. but it's Not the opposite good. of that um, yeah these are the these are the jobs that um export goods and import money from outside of your market yes yes that's exactly and then right non-basic job circulates dollars that are already in the market. Already in the market, which eventually, which dwindles over time. So because of? Because of taxes. and Savings. And, yeah, and yeah, savings. Great. And, Beautiful. And all that. Yeah. So when you have jobs that are coming into the market, if you can figure out if those are basic or non-basic jobs, you can figure out the total number of jobs that, that can all bring. So if you got, say, 200. All right, non- let me slow you down. Like you're on a roll, yeah. but I just want to uh, fill in just a few gaps here. Okay. Because you're about to mention things like the economic base multiplier. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. The way you figure out an economic base multiplier is you analyze the jobs currently in a place mm-hmm. and you figure out how many jobs are in this market that are basic and, and non-basic. And then you can figure out the multiplier mm-hmm. between the basic and the non-basic or the basic and the total. Right. Then when you look at new jobs coming in, mm-hmm. And you can figure out if those are basic and non-basic, you can apply the economic base multiplier to the new basic jobs mm-hmm. because basic jobs create non-basic, non-basic jobs. jobs. Yeah. And you can apply that multiplier. So pick it up yeah. to where you were. So you can apply that multiplier and you can figure out the total number of jobs, mm-hmm. which helps you get to total number of households, right? Or the the the, the, num- the average number. You skipped of a, you skipped Okay. A logical step. So you go from new basic jobs, you can figure out how many total new jobs right. those basic jobs create. And those total jobs, now you can apply the population to employment ratio yes. that every market has. Mm-hmm. And you can say, okay, if we're going to have this many new jobs, then we're going to have this many new what? People. People. Mm-hmm. That's exactly right. So and you can figure out how, how many total Po- how much total population growth you're going to have based on a basic jobs announcement. Mm-hmm. Then from there, if you want to figure out households, mm-hmm. you take the total population and you divide it by the average household size. Right. Then you get to total households. Right. Then you can apply what percentage in this market own versus rent. Mm-hmm. And now you figure out how many more apartments you need. Right. In that ex- it, right in that example, so right. that's economic base analysis. Yes, you need to figure out your EBM, economic base multiplier, your population to employment ratio, and there's and we teach in that CI one hundred and two course from the CCIM Institute. We teach how to figure that stuff out. Yes, yep. yeah, but that's a great and that's a great. Exp- that was like our first one, I think. I'm very right? impressed. Like yeah, that yeah. whole. Yeah, baby. All right. What is... Are you smarter than a designee on EBM? And I think this will be my... I've got two more questions. Okay. One I think you'll know and one I think we've never talked about. Okay. What is gap analysis? This is... You're looking at the demand gap, Mm -hmm. right? So you're trying to figure out the supply and demand of office, industrial, the, the categories... I was in Pop Bellies in Evanston when I was editing this one. So I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> um, why was I up there? I don't know. Um, so basically, if, if I want to open up a business here and I'm talking to you about a space, okay, let me, you can help me figure out if there's a demand for it. Well, let me just simplify this a little bit. Great. What's the formula 
for a gap analysis, regardless of property type? Like right. what's the fundamental formula? Supply minus demand. No, demand minus supply. Attaboy. Mom got it wrong. Demand minus supply. Demand minus supply. Demand minus supply. Mm-hmm. So regardless of how your property, like retail, figures out demand based on dollars, office figures out demand based on total employment, uh, residential to total households, right? Um, the different They look at demand differently, but regardless of that, you quantify demand and then you see how much supply, how much actual space is in the market. And then you can figure out if there's a gap or not. Mm-hmm. And if you can identify a gap, let's say a market needs another 10,000 apartments that it doesn't have. Mm-hmm. Well, if you're an apartment developer, if you work with apartment developers, or if you want to work with department uh, apartment developers, that's information you can use to go make money. So yeah. gap analysis, retailers do this a lot. You know, They're always doing gap analysis to decide if they want to locate a store. Uh, right. Right. Someplace, but yeah. Yeah. Good. That's gap analysis at a high level. And then have we ever talked about shift share analysis? Shift share? Shift share. So I'll try to do this in a minute. This is a couple hours of a day. Would this be a good episode yeah. to do? It might or? be a little bit too geeky okay. to do. Okay. But imagine this. You look at Owensboro, Kentucky, five years for in the past and you figure out how many jobs there were and in what industry sectors those jobs are. Okay. And then you compare that to the same, what were those, what did those numbers look like last year? Mm -hmm. What shift share does is it explains why those numbers changed and you do it by segmenting the Delta between those two dates and jobs, amount of jobs you segment them into three buckets, okay? National growth is one of the buckets. And the idea here is the United States grew this percentage mm-hmm. in jobs. We're sure. talking in number of jobs. Right. Grew this many jobs over those that same time period. Therefore, because Owensboro, Kentucky is in the United States, we're going to explain job growth here because it was in America. Yeah. In America. In America. So Merck. if, you know, 6.4% job growth over that period of time, then we're going to allocate 6.4% of the job growth here because it was in America. Yeah, okay. That's national growth. You're going to stick it in that bucket, and you're going to put that bucket over there. Okay. You don't really need to use that information. You're getting those jobs kind of off the off the table. Okay. All right? Now, the second bucket is your industry mix. And you're going to take a look at the industries in the United States. Manufacturing. Manufacturing grew 10% over the last year or this period of time. And so we would follow that that industry would do that well here too. Mm -hmm. And so we allocate that amount of jobs to the industries that are present in Owensboro, but not how those industries did in Owensboro. It's how did those industries do nationwide And because we have those industries here, that amount of job growth or loss is allocated to the industry mix bucket. Mm -hmm. We're going to put that over there because we don't really care about that either. Okay. Not much. We don't care about national growth quite at all. The industry mix bucket, we might care about a little bit when we're trying to analyze the market. But what's left then is the regional shift numbers. Mm -hmm. And the regional shift numbers explain, uh, I'm sorry, they don't explain, they identify comparative advantage. Mm. What comparative advantage is, is that there is something special about Owensboro that when it comes to this place, we're just doing better than everywhere else. Mm. Yeah. So if I analyze a Dunder market, Mifflin, Scranton, yeah, 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 <laughs> or like in Nashville, what do you think their comparative advantages are? Music. Okay. What else? Uh, multifamily. No, no, no. This is all about jobs, not oh, about jobs. property types. Yeah. So a lot of music, entertainment. Yeah. Okay. Music, entertainment, tourism. You could uh-huh. probably name off some other things. Uh, healthcare. Some of the largest 
uh, hospital systems in the United States are headquartered in Nashville. So there's big medical, not doctors, but like insurance. Um, pro- probably have more than their share of insurance shops. What about Austin, Texas? Yeah, that that would be also be entertainment. Yep. Um, but comedy. More than anything else now. Jiu-jitsu. Tech. Oh, yeah. Like Tesla's relocated there. Right, There's right. a lot of tech jobs. They've got a comparative advantage. And they're attracting those jobs from other places. Like something's up. So when you do this analysis and you segment part of it out for national growth, mm-hmm. it's just get those off the table. Industry mix, get those off the table. What you're left with, when you see big amounts of job growth that are in that regional shift sector, so it might be business and financial services, it might be uh, retail jobs, it might be, you know, whatever industry sectors. Now, I know, all right, for whatever reason in this market, they seem to have a comparative advantage in this sector. It's like an indicator light. Mm -hmm. And I want to see big regional shift job numbers. And it tells me which industry sectors have a comparative advantage. And then I would have to like go start reading their newspaper or call somebody down there and say, look, it really seems like you've got something figured out when it comes to this sector of jobs. Like, why is that? Mm -hmm. Well, we've got a, um, you know, a military base here and the FBI just moved 5,000 people, like 5,000 FBI agents to this, to this market. And we got a Mazda plant Mm. and we, well, that's Huntsville, Alabama. Yeah. Oh, wow. That I just described. And so, like, they're, they've got a lot of stuff going on. Well, if I run a regional shift or a shift share analysis on them, I'm going to see government jobs, comparative advantage. I'm going to see manufacturing. I'm going to see that they have a comparative advantage. Yeah. But I'm not going to know why yet. Yeah. So I got to do a little, little bit of research, and I can figure that out pretty quick. And then I can figure out, do I want to invest dollars in this market? Yeah. And if so, what property types might be better based on their comparative advantages? Right. That you so figured out during the sh- the shift share sh- share it analysis. Yeah. yeah. So that's what shift share is. Yeah. That's and very interesting. When you look at economic base analysis, you see what's in place today with those ratios EBM and PER. And then you project forward, mm-hmm. right? Shift share analysis, you look back. Yeah. And it gives you a feel for how they got to where they are. And it provides a lot of context for your economic base analysis. Yeah. So when you use those two things in conjunction, you can really make some smart plays when you're looking at one market versus another. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. that that would be... That's information you want to figure out if you're interested in investing outside of your market. I mean, I guess it can help in your market too to figure out what advantage you got. But So if I were going to, say, grab a buddy of mine and create an investment fund mm-hmm. where we'd raise, say, maybe $10 million and then make um, and like co-invest with great deal sponsors in markets all across the United States. Yeah. A key part of our analysis as as deciding where we're going to allocate the fund's investment dollars is a big time look into market analysis in comparing markets before we ever actually look at the particular deal itself. Yeah. Rather than sifting through a bunch of deals, you're figuring out what kind of deals that you want to sift through. Actually, what I'm looking at when I'm doing shift share and economic base analysis is what markets provide me the greatest opportunity for growth Mm. and mitigation of risk. Mm. I want diversified economies, which have comparative advantages in multiple different industry sectors Mm. that have strong economic base multipliers and basic job growth. Yeah. And if I can find those markets, then I can invest in those places, regardless of whether it's multifamily or office or industrial, probably wouldn't be office these days, but I I can invest with a lot of confidence because they've got super strong job creating economies that are diversified 
And if one big employer goes belly up, it doesn't crush the whole economy. Yeah. And hurt my property. Right, right. Yep. Yeah. Oh, interesting. All right. So look, this whole episode has been a quiz, but we basically, I skipped around quite a bit. Sure, but yeah. These are all things, everything we talked about, you will have learned going through the CCIM education. Yeah. To get your designation. Like you have to learn everything we talked about today. Right. And about four times more that we didn't have time for in an episode like sure. this. Or that we just flat have never talked about before. Right. But, right. Yet. Yeah. This was a good recap as yeah. well. It's also really fun and clear to see how much you've actually learned yeah. through 30 some odd episodes. Right. Like it's yeah. kind of staggering. I like I like this. It yeah. was like a big giant quickie quiz in a way. It was. Yeah. Basically, yeah. Yeah. And we've had like I was in Seattle a couple weeks ago at the annual governance meeting for the CCIM Institute. Yeah. And I think I was sharing with you like I've never been more famous in a group of people before <laughs> because of the podcast, but they did, like everybody wants to know about you. <laughs> like I'm not exaggerating when I say at least 30 people ask me about you. And a lot of them commented on like how much you've actually grown in your knowledge of commercial real estate. And a couple people didn't believe me when I told them that you're not in the business. No, not at all. Yep. No, nope. I was like, maybe we can get yeah. him in at some point, but maybe, <laughs> I mean, I probably have to rope you, tie you up. And yeah. <laughs> he does have an office here, but it's only until I rent that office and then he's <laughs> going right. packing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. No, yeah, not only do, did I not know any of this, I didn't, had no interest in it. Even still, like not as an insult, but you know, oh, no, I, doing yeah. all this, but I don't get the sense at all that you're trying to get in the business. I'm not. We're just having fun doing a podcast. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love that I'm learning about what you do. And I love, I just, I love how my appreciation for what you do and for what dad has done uh, has just grown so, so much. And uh, I knew you were smart. I knew you were good at this, but I didn't know to what level or, you know, but. Well, man, that's I probably would... the same in reverse. Like, I know you're talented. Right. And I love what you do. Yeah. And and you've made me laugh your entire life and stuff. But yeah. like, I do not know what goes into being that good at what you do. Like, right. I, I don't know that stuff. Right, right. And yeah. we could probably do this podcast in reverse. Call it something else. I'll sit over there. Dramatically and you teach speaking. Me a, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Comedically speaking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it would probably, I bet I'd be just as impressed. Yeah. With the art, uh, yeah. the art form or all the work that goes into making something look easy. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Oh, cool. Well, maybe, uh, maybe we'll have a, Maybe we'll start an, an, a different podcast called Comedically Speaking, you know, break through the different types of musicals and <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and the the formats and the how you can, uh, the, you know, like uh, the I Wish song at the beginning where they really want to get out and they want something, you know. And, Wait a and second. How, Are you telling me that there's a formula? Yeah. Now, see. I would be interested in learning the formula. Yeah. Like formula. how it's put together. Yes. And yes, there's a formula Because like to there's that. a formula to story for sure. There's a formula to story. There's a formula to blockbuster movies. There's a formula to every Marvel film. There's a formula to TV shows, three camera TV shows. There's a formula. There's a formula to one single cam TV shows. Um, there's a formula to jokes. You know, but they, they all are in different styles. And when it comes to improv, you know, if I wanted, if we we're going to break it down into just musical improv, I need to know the different types of musicals out there from Andrew Lloyd Webber to, um, you know, you name another one, Tim, uh, uh, Elton John, right? Um, Lion King. But then you're able to play within this formula and you you don't know what's going to happen, but you know where you got to get to, mm -hmm. right? The the next part in or the, the story yep. or the next type of song that's to be sung. What characters need to be introduced at this point? When does the villain come in? See, this reminds me of like learning scales on the guitar mm. so that you can play 
-hmm. guitar solo almost by feel. Yeah. Because you know the scale so well. And when it's time, it just comes out of you. Right. And yeah. It, you're improving something you've spent hundreds of hours of right. rote repetition. Right. Doing these scales and then it just comes out, which I've never been able to do. Right. But And that breaks down into like the conscious and the subconscious mind, your frontal uh, cortex, right? Prefrontal cortex. Prefrontal co cortex. Pre the things that we, we use when we learn stuff or trying to do things. And oftentimes you have to free yourself of that to trust self to your body knows what it's going to do and knows how to react in the moment and get your conscious self out of the way so yes. it can do that yeah yeah, yeah. and that's particular. i lack the ability to do that so no far you life. don't well so don't. far i yeah, have yeah. lacked pulling that off yeah but you pull it off every day in real life when you have conversations off the fly in the moment mm -hmm. with your family, your or wife. Or when you react to swerve around a car who stopped in the middle of the road. 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 muscle memory. Sense. Well, I have yet to be able to pull that off on a guitar. Oh, on a sure. Guitar. <laughs> sure, 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 sure. But, but there are some things that I could teach you that, could, that you could practice that would free yourself from that to have these moments when you're playing. Is this why all the 90s action movies were all... The same? Cocaine ridden. <laughs> well, no. <laughs> Is that a different thing? No, that could help free for yourself from the prefrontal <laughs> cortex. <laughs> um, oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't know. <laughs> Thanks for listening to commercially speaking. <laughs> yeah, for real. Let's end this while we're ahead. All right. All right. Love you, brother. Love you. Bye, Alice. Yeah, <laughs> Bye, <laughs> Alice. <laughs>、Yep. I hear footsteps. Yes. We have a special guest, I believe. Ah. <laughs> you want to jump up、Hello. here? <laughs> Birdie, what do you think about depreciation?